Organizacije ochrane zdrojeva v Ukrajini, Jarno Habihta. Jarno, please, come to the stage. The stage is yours. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Hello to everybody. And uh, actually, when you are on the stage, you actually don't see the people because the cameras are so light. But I, I know that you are there somewhere. And um, I must admit that's my first this type of talk. And when I was invited, I got really scared. I have uh, avoided 20 years of going to this type of talk. So um, I hope I don't faint, but I do my best. So first of all, it's a great pleasure from the World Health Organization side to be in such an event. I understand that it's one of the first public health weeks we organize uh, in Ukraine. It is happening in Kiev, but then starts to go across the country. And uh, for us, as a World Health Organization, it's beautiful to have that near to the World Health Day uh, as tomorrow, because um, we feel still young. We are an organization that celebrates tomorrow the 71st birthday. So uh, it's a great and many things at the same time together. So I will share with you some of the topics uh, which are related to uh, 10 threats that we have in public health. I look some of the reflections, how the development community has come together to address many of those threats. And then I share some of my reflections also on Ukraine and how we are here. So a few months ago, World Health Organization said, these are the 10 threats that we have in the world. And when I started to read about that, then these look global, but then when you read them, and I will reflect a little bit on them, we understand that many of those are actually also very relevant to us here in Ukraine. First is air pollution and climate change. Do you know that nine out of 10 people, so are actually breathing polluted air daily? It's a lot. We lose 7 million people annually because of this. And that's one of the biggest threats that we have now. And we have many things to do. Or non-communicable diseases. We have discussed about that a while in the world. It is the five diseases like cancer, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, but also mental health. And every year, globally, 70% of all deaths together actually are related to non-communicable diseases. We lose 15 million people annually because of non-communicable diseases. And that's why it's a threat for us, especially as the whole world is aging as well. Global influenza pandemics. It has been around us. We have been debating about that. And there is a lot of uncertainty because we don't know when it comes, and how severe it is. But we know that it is there, and that's why public health community works on surveillance. We have surveillance systems across the 100 countries in the world to be ready, and that's why we also build up the seasonal influenza vaccines. In the world, in the current world we are living, there are fragile and vulnerable settings due to the protracted emergencies, floods, but if you start to think about the world where 22% of the world population does not have access to the essential services, that's one fifth of the world. That's why we need to address and build up more stronger services for them. In the modern medicine, we have antibiotics. None of us around here, I think, remembers how was, to be, was life before the, we had antibiotics. We need antibiotics to treat pneumonia, gonorrhea. You can have a list. You are here, many of you around here in the room are professionals in the health field. But today, all the sectors, health, agriculture, environment, needs to come together because the bacteria are, and fungi, they are becoming more and more wiser to be resistant. So we need to work together that actually we have antibiotics, which allow us to treat diseases. But even as a doctor, I started to think, is it only about the diseases? We need actually all those drugs also to run safe surgery. 
So there are many things that we need, and that's why antibiotic resistance is something which is raised as a priority also at the United Nations level. And area like vaccine hesitancy, and we had uh, discussions just a few minutes ago about immunization, but do you know that in the world, because we have vaccines, we save annually two to three million people. They are alive, they are among us because of that. But if we would have less hesitancy and really reach out to the last mile, we could save one to two million more children and adults because of good vaccination programs. And HIV AIDS, in the world where we have 37 million people living with HIV, the good news is also that we have already 22 million of them on the treatment. So we have threats, but I didn't want to start only with threats and mention it. We have many stories to tell that actually public health is advancing and moving forward. I was looking this morning to the statistics and realized that if we look Europe now, let's come closer to Ukraine, then in last five years, when we have a statistics, we look years 2010 until 2015, our life expectancy has increased more than one year. In Europe, on average, we can almost live 78 years old on average. At the same time, the maternal mortality has decreased. We have decreased the maternal mortality for 100,000 newborns from 13 to 11. That's a great success. Also, we are here in the world where we are moving forward to ensure also that we can live in polio-free world. We have few countries yet, and the process is there to really be uh, polio-free. So what I want to say, we have threats, but also we have opportunities. And what is important that we, in this room and beyond, really unite for the public health. So what the world global community has done. A few years ago, we agreed to on sustainable development goals. And it's very, very important to us. Sometimes it looks somewhere far away. Somebody in New York is discussing about sustainable development, but here in Kiev, the life is, for example, different, or how we live in Odessa or Kharkiv or Lviv. But sustainable development goals are there really for everybody and to leave nobody behind. And we have health and well-being goal, and each of us has a role to achieve that goal. What was important a few years ago when the world community discussed about development was the also how much interconnections there are, how many determinants we have, social determinants, economic, commercial, that influence health and interconnectivity. So that's why the sustainable development era gives us actually so many more opportunities to improve health and contribute to the development. So I hope that together we can do that also in Ukraine. And in WHO, we have set also the goals for the next few years to really unite everybody to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable. So we have developed strategies and we have frameworks to address those challenges. So when I prepared for today's talk, um, I really didn't know how deep I should discuss on all the substance, and we have so many good speakers. So I thought I will reflect on two, three topics now. One is related to universal health coverage, second one on non-communicable diseases, and third one in public health. And I must apologize, I don't go to great detail because then you need to be with me a few days. Uh, but I will try to reflect some of the topics and I know that the next speakers will also cover. So one area that we all work actually, and also Ukraine has been one of the flagship countries, is moving towards universal health coverage. Let's think about the word moving. That means we move towards it, but we never reach it, unfortunately. But it's a goal towards we are moving, and then we need to think what actually it means. And universal health coverage is really that we get services when we need, which are appropriate quality without us getting to the financial hardship. And on the services, it is important to understand that here WHO sees all the services we have 
from prevention, promotion, to the treatment, to the rehabilitation and palliative care. So it's the whole continuity of services we need as citizens to be healthy and make healthy choices. So why it is so important? Today in the world, we know that actually there are billions who don't have access to the essential services. Actually half of the world doesn't have access to the essential health services. And that's a lot. We have done so much advancement in technology, in innovation, putting primary health care in place, but still people cannot have an access. And I know that many people in Ukraine have the same concern. But even furthermore, where we look to the financial protection, we know that in the world on average, uh, we have 12% of households who need to spend more than 10% of their household income to pay for the health care. And that's a lot. That's why they sometimes delay the going to the doctor when they need or they find other coping mechanisms. So that is something that we are there. Somehow was not able to copy, was not uh, meant to be there, I see. But uh, what are the solutions? One of the solutions is really um, primary health care. To invest to the strong primary health care, and this is something that also uh, you have been doing, but the road is long. Because primary health care can really cover around 80% of the needs that population has. We just recently launched a study in WHO Europe, uh, yesterday to be precise, we looked what are the health financing and service delivery uh, policy options to have better access and move towards universal health coverage. One is to de develop very good design of the package which really takes into account the vulnerable, poor, and those who need to use more health services, especially look also to affordability of medicines. The other is that we need to have governments who really prioritize health, who really allocate proper public resources for the health sector, because that allows us to ensure that the resources are there, there are decrease of out-of-pocket payments, and there is a decrease of informal payments. And when we look to the evidence across the 28 countries in Europe, we see that actually we should have the out-of-pocket payments level across the whole health system. So from the total health financing package, around 15%, one five. The number in Ukraine is more or less the other way around. So if we want to move towards universal health coverage, we really need to invest to the primary care, we need to ensure that the essential medicines are there, available, accessible, and affordable. But also we need to invest to the strong public health services, because this helps really to move forward. So universal health coverage in somehow in, is in all of our hands. Let me now go to the second topic I wanted to talk. I mentioned before that non-communicable diseases is really among one of the 10 threats. Do you know that in the middle-income countries, we in Ukraine are also middle-income country, every second second, somebody dies from non-communicable diseases. Every second second. That's a lot. So when we look to the disease burden, and this is illustrative, uh, we see that as countries prosper, we have more non-communicable diseases. To be precise, the number, uh, according to the latest statistics in Ukraine, is 91%. And if we look at the five diseases I mentioned before, it's around 80% that we have. So it's a huge burden. And the question for me is, as we are moving forward and celebrating the Public Health Week, are the public health services ready to address the challenges that we have from non-communicable diseases? Let's take that question with us when also some of you go back to your workplaces, some of you are working with other sectors, are we ready actually to address that non-communicable disease burden to be healthier? And most important, we want to address that we don't die too early. We look to the premature mortality. Do we have solutions? Yes, we have solutions actually. 
In WHO, with a global public health community, we developed a list of best buys. We looked at the cost effectiveness, we looked what works actually. And there are many interventions we can have. And there are successes also in Ukraine. One is tobacco control. Tobacco control is one of the most cost effective interventions if we put the whole package together. That means that every dollar we invest to the tobacco control, because of people be getting healthy, more productive, it brings back $7.4 on average. In some countries it can be higher, some countries it can be lower, but it is very important intervention. We can look to the tax policies, we can look to the smoke-free rooms. I really have a dream, as always my daughter also says, can we always go to the restaurant and nobody smokes? Can we walk in the street that there is nobody in front of me smoking? Um, I have had long walks in Kiev streets, this is not always the case. And I think we have a lot of things to do. Uh, but on tobacco control, that's one of the area to do. And when we look to the tax policies, we can apply the same when it comes to sugar, su sweets, as well the harmful use of alcohol. Nutrition. We heard previously also nutrition and salo. I will not talk about that. Uh, but I will mention that actually we know what the healthy nutrition is. I will not ask you who had five portions of fruit and vegetables this morning because it's Saturday morning. Of course you had that. And they were all five different colors and you remember to do that every day. And if you ask what is the portion, the portion is very easy to measure. The portion is what fits in your hand. So actually public health is quite a lot of fun. And, but we know that actually that's an area, the nutrition is very, very important. I would like only to say one area that has not been discussed so much is also how much salt we use. In Europe, on average, we use more than 10 grams of salt if we look across 53 countries and statistics. We should use less than 5 grams. We should decrease it twice. And that's how we actually start to prevent also the hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases. And to be honest, according to the research, we don't even feel that we eat less salt. So I think salt is one of the cost-effective interventions that brings back actually from every dollar we invest almost $12.8. So there are solutions, but also we need to have primary care that we mentioned before, which is giving us counseling, helping us, ensures that there is affordable medicines available to treat the diseases and chronic conditions when it's needed. But also we need to have a primary health care where, for example, vaccines, are also not only for children, for, uh, but for adults. Because one very cost-effective intervention that we have in public health is basically vaccination and co uh, against the human papillomavirus that actually helps many girls and women actually to prevent cervical cancer. So if you don't know the whole list, there is, it's available in WHO site, but we know what needs to be done. We have high burden, but we have also the solutions. I have one small dream now living in Ukraine. I really like your chocolate. And if you can make it trans fat free, that I like even more. But let me come back to the vaccination and immunization. That's also an opportunity. And when I look to the statistics of Ukraine, I see that every third child in the very early start of life does not really benefit from the full calendar and being fully vaccinated. So that's an opportunity for us. Why I talk about that opportunity? Yeah, again, we look very often at the economy and we say there is not much money for public health and so on. But that's so cost-effective intervention. After water and sanitation, that is really something that would help us. If you look the benefits, being healthier, productive. Every dollar we invest to the immunization brings us back $16. If you look lifespan, how long we live, every dollar we invest to the immunization brings back $44. It's one of the cost of most cost-effective interventions and has saved so many lives and has so much more potential. So I hope that when we talk about all innovation and ideas, 
we don't forget also the basics of the public health when we address the challenges that we have. So what keeps me awake in the night and happy in the morning are these opportunities. Because there are so many of them. We know that we can work together. And what is important is that we actually all have a role in public health. Regardless if we are in the government, if we are uh, civil servants, if we work somewhere in a very other sector, or we are doctors, all we have a role. The governments have a role to allocate proper resources, prioritize health, and make a regulation that we can make healthy choices. We can go to run, we can be healthier, we can be in the smoke-free room. But we have a then role to make those healthy choices, and we expect also the doctors to give us proper advice. So I think that keeps me so energized most of the time, that I know that we all can do something good in public health in our life, even if we have many threats, we have also many opportunities. And if each of us does something, then the life in Ukraine will be much nicer, happier, healthier. And that's why I like to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Arnaud.